Welcome everybody to this morning's webinar where we're going to have a look at um, some investment strategies for 2021 and um, you know I guess look backwards as well and, and have a look at the impact that um, world events this year have, have had on the markets um, and, and the world economy in general. So today we're um, joined by Tony Bates. Um, many of you will um, be familiar with Tony. Tony is the director at Bluepoint Consulting um, and works closely with a number of our clients. So I'd like to welcome Tony along. Thank you, Mark. Welcome, welcome everybody. <laughs> I'm, I'm beaming from the moon. It's COVID safe up here on the moon. <laughs> um, so Tony's um, you know, held a number of senior positions you know, with stockbrokers, fund managers, private banks and accounting firms. And uh, as I said, a number of our clients um, have have met Tony over the last four years or so. Um, so Tony, we'll probably just start with maybe giving a little bit of background as, you know, what a normal day looks like for you in your world. Um, very different from an accountant, I suspect. <laughs> I suspect. Um, we're probably not so focused on minute by minute, hour by hour, but um, certainly if a client needs needs our attention we you know they say jump we say how high but but um our day is probably a more flexible it's, it's certainly very family friendly in my experience but um as long as clients know that you're looking after them and that you care um they're, they're less they're less fussed about what hour of the day or that sort of thing so yeah i i, I look after a, i guess a number of reasonably wealthy families um i am based in sydney and i come as as you know down to shell harbor uh, once a week or every other week yeah. So we'll probably um, get to the important part, and this is very important in relation to the financial services world. So just, um, you know, pointing out that this advice and, and in the things that Tony runs through today is general advice only and um, doesn't take into account your personal objectives, financial situation or needs. Um, and Tony's um, an authorised representative of, of Blue Point. Um, who holds an Australian financial services license, um, which, as I mentioned before, Tony's also um, owner and director of, of Blue Point. So we might make a start, and um, it's been well documented that that 2020 has been a year like no other. Um, and we've touched on the impact pr predominantly of COVID um, you know, on businesses, and we've looked at it from a legal point of view a marketing point of view, a, a disruption point of view. Um, and today we're going to have a look at it from, from an investing point of view. And, um, you know, one of the basis of one of the influence of the investing side of things is uh, the economics of the world. And we might start there. And I guess, uh, you know, one of the key drivers this year has obviously been COVID and the impact that it's having on, on economies around the world. Yeah. And this, this, slide thank you mark for this slide um this is what the, the prime minister held up in february march um and said what we need to do we could we could let this virus run through our our our, our population and we would put pressure on on well we, we would have people die but we would have pressure on our medical system so the whole argument was that we should flatten the curve and certainly what we had in the uh, in australia and around europe and, and and america was a flattened curve but if you can go to the next slide what we're seeing actually is a second wave. We've had a second wave in Melbourne, which was quite alarming for, for our, our fellow Australians. And I've cancelled my trip to Adelaide for the second time this year because they're now going through a second wave. And you can see these, these are the economies on the chart that have had the most impact. So the orange line is, is India. The, the, if you can highlight the American line there, Mark, it's the line sort of towards the top in the green. Um, where they've, you can see, you know, a first wave and then a second wave through July. And if you see towards the end of the chart, and in fact, if you can go to the next chart. Um, I need to catch up. Here we go. You can see my yep. mouse now. <laughs> um, this is heading into the election. But if you go to the very next chart, um, we're actually seeing um, a third wave in America that is actually quite alarming. Um, yep. and, and Being the green line there. Exponential. Yeah. Um, now, obviously, there's news um, earlier this week from Pfizer about a 90% chance vaccine and, and one overnight from Moderna, 95% chance. And obviously, a vaccine 
needs to get amongst the populations of these countries um, in, in the right order and in an orderly fashion. Um, but the, the truth is the, the global economy is in recession. There's no question about that. Australia's in a recession. Um, if you can go to the next slide, we can actually um, see um, the well, impact it's had on economy. Yeah. Ah, sorry. This <laughs> guy. <laughs> Third wave is so bad that, uh, that Donald Trump is insisting on staying home for another four years. The third wave in America. And I guess that's probably one of the things in the lead up to the US election was, you know, whether the outcome would have an impact on markets. And, and have we seen that already, um, even though it officially hasn't been decided yet? Americans love, we can actually, we have tracked, or we haven't, but we've seen research that tracks the October, November period every four years for the last 30 or 40 years. And almost always it falls heading into an election and it almost always rises out of an election quite dramatically. And the, the best result is in fact um, a split house Congress and you know, the two houses in the US where it's split, where, so there's a check by the Republicans on the Democrats or by the Democrats on the Republicans. And so what we're seeing is a result uh, notwithstanding the fact that Donald Trump's still sitting at that desk with his tweeting away. Um, but but the, the US market has already reacted very, very positively to, to the result, to, to the fact that there is a result. And it's, a, you know, you can argue state by state, and we can be still sitting here in January and, and seeing whether or not the, uh, the, the, the army is called in to remove Donald Trump. But Americans believe there is a result and, and is saying so in the marketplace. Yeah. So I guess that, um, as you pointed out, the you know, the impact of our trading partners and how they're dealing with the, the virus obviously will in some way, you know, shape our economy. And if we have a look um, sort of at the, the import side of things, um, firstly. So the, these are the countries that we import from. And uh, sorry that it's a bit hazy. The, the detail is not important. What's important is China, the United States, Japan, Thailand, Germany, and South Korea, and Malaysia, and Singapore are the countries that we import the most from. So it's in relevant to us how those economies are doing uh, post-COVID. Um, and, you know, China had an economic statement uh, overnight and a, and, a, and a forecast to double again in the next 15 years. Um, and our, our, our challenge in Australia, and everyone knows this, is we're a one trick pony we're, we're almost too reliant on china and certainly in the last six months we've seen um threats against our barley industry against our wine industry and other industries so we we've got to be very cautious over the next 20 years the next decades uh to not be so reliant on china but china um whether you believe the statistics or not uh seems to not have new cases of covid uh, as we sit here in november 2020 um, United States, uh, we are reliant on, and we have seen the COVID cases climbing. This is the import side, but equally, we, we, we want our customers to be able to buy from us. And it's a very similar list. China, Japan, South Korea, United States, United Kingdom, Singapore, Taiwan, India. And if you think those economies through, with the exception of the United States, um, COVID is really... Um, not doing too badly in a lot of those economies. The United Kingdom also, obviously, um, cases rising there at the moment. India has had its, uh, you know, huge numbers in a highly populated country, but um, the cases are dropping off there. So if you can go to just the next slide there, Mark, it, it, we, we just look at the, um, all of those economies, the, the slide to the, 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 the X bar is, is the drop in the economy. Uh, Australia in red there. Uh, so our economy did drop. Um, and then the deaths per million people. So countries to the far right had a very high death rate. Countries towards the bottom had a huge impact on their economy. Uh, the, the, those at the sort of uh, top left-hand corner um, are, are those that have done the best. And some of those names that we just read out, um, not all of them are on there, but a lot of the Asian countries have done pretty well. A lot of our customers have done pretty well, South Korea outstandingly. Uh, and so you've got to look at, at um, from an economic point of view, how Australia is going to fare based on how our customers are faring. And I guess the, 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 um, the whole um, approach in each country to an extent has been different is, is finding that balance between keeping the economy going and, and managing 
the, the actual illness in the population. Yep. Livelihoods, and, and if we, livelihoods is the way our Prime Minister described it. Um, uh, yes. and, and it was the flattening of the curve. It was very much that argument. Yeah. Um, so in relation to, um, we might just skip over that one, uh, the impact of um, GDP or, or gross domestic product, which is, I guess, a measure of what a company can produce. Um, yeah, this graph looks at, at, at the trend, I guess, pre and post virus and comparing Australia to the rest of the world. Yeah, it does. And the whole global economy went into recession. Um, it had an impact globally. Um, Mark and I were discussing this slide and it looks like our fall is uh, a little bit later and a little bit sharper. So we had the March quarter results and then the June quarter results and then the September quarter results. And so you can actually see uh, the Australian um, measure of GDP in each of those quarters. And the estimates are, from the line going forwards, we don't know. I mean, you can see a, a positive December quarter. So if that's correct, um, we're out of recessions. Um, and arguably the US is out of recession. Uh, I, I'll, I'll wait to see the outcome of uh, the December quarter, but um, uh, you, uh, you know, business people in the audience might be sort of feeling uh, a recovery. Um, certainly the reopening of borders and the reopening of Victoria in particular is, uh, is, has got to be positive, uh, but we're a long, long, long way from reopening international borders. Yeah, and I think um, if you look at, at the level, um, sort of on a low, uh, the, the impact on a local level, um, and you know, we see uh, the impact through our clients, obviously, and, and, and the, the businesses that they deal with. Um, you know, it doesn't feel like we're in a big recession. Um, I think there, there are certainly um, a number of businesses that are struggling and, and have had restrictions on their ability to trade. Um, but um, what we're seeing across the client base, for the most part, is those businesses that have been able to trade are doing okay. Um, they're not necessarily, some of them are better than what they were pre-COVID, uh, but the majority are probably just um, staying the course, if you like. So, but that's, a, that's obviously um, a narrow look on things. The, the situation in Victoria is going to impact Australia's numbers, no doubt. Yep. And, and I think the next slide talks to the unemployment, uh, the, the one on the right. Um, you know, there's the 81 recession, which some of us might remember. Um, I was in short pants, but uh, the 1990 recession, the recession we had to have, um, the unemployment fall was uh, grinding down uh, to, you know, levels that were actually, this, this is the fall in employment, but, but the unemployment levels got to sort of 10% in the 1990s recession and took a decade to get back. Um, we have a very different scenario where, you know, this COVID thing was, a, was an event, um, the 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 Fall in unemployment was really a government-based decision based on flattening the curve, and we've seen a V-style recovery in employment. Um, uh, I think we got some more jobless numbers out this week, but we'll see how they they pan out. But um, if 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 you know the, the economy recovers, if the borders reopen, and if people go back about their daily um, lives because they they feel confident that we're handling, that we're tracking, we're tracing, that we can safely go about our daily lives then this will be a very short recession. Um, and that unemployment rate will recover, you know, reasonably quickly. And you can see the US recovery in the, uh, in, in the jobless claims uh, on, on the left-hand side there. So similar in the US, and they've taken a different attitude to handling the COVID crisis. And as you know, you could place the number of new cases going to diagonally opposite to the jobless claims um, at the moment. But, uh, you know, at this stage, um, my fears that I perhaps had in July, August, uh, that we may, it, it may take years to recover from this. Um, I'm a little more optimistic with some of the announcements from the uh, big medical companies. So with um, just highlighting this graph here, because I think it, it paints an interesting story that, the, as you said, the 1981 recession, unemployment fell from its, I guess its normal level, it fell and uh, or rose an additional 3%. Um, and that, the, 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 the rise in unemployment and then the recovery back to where we were pre-recession took about two years. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, whereas... I, was, I, was, I, remember, I remember the early 80s. Um, uh, it was a fairly optimistic period. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And but within in the nineteen ninety recession, it, it took four years for unemployment to to recover. Um, so this, like you said, this is an interesting one. That the drop has certainly been a lot, a lot steeper and deeper. Um, we've got that classic V-shaped recovery. And it would have been deeper and steeper still if we didn't have um, job keeper. Yep, yep, definitely. Um, but yeah, where I guess where it goes from here will be interesting. Um, and we've got the New South Wales budget that's being handed down today, which. Um, We'll have some measures to to boost employment, and, and um, um, you know, Gary's spoken about it in previous webinars. In that the the approach from from both the federal and state government is a business led recovery, and, and a lot of those measures, um, certainly in the the um, state government budget today, will look to do that. Certainly with some of the payroll tax concessions um, that have been announced. Um, so we move on and have a look and, you know, COVID has been a significant world event, um, but it's also interesting to see how COVID stacks up against other significant world events um, over the last century or so um, and, and what impact that's had um, on the share market. Yeah, and, and it feels pretty horrible in the middle of it. Um, you know, March was a very unpleasant moment, but... I, I used this graph in webinars in March and, you know, it, we've been here before. And, and probably the obvious one is, is in the 20s with the Spanish flu. That's the closest thing I can think of to this event. Um, there was a second wave, which was a much bigger, bigger killer. Uh, and I, there was a lot of doomsday talk in the middle of the year about that. Um, but you actually look at the share market in the 20s. And that's why in the titles to the slide, I've talked about the roaring 20s. You know, if history repeats itself, it could be a very attractive time to be invested uh, in the share market over the next 10 years. Um, yeah. But I call them the bumps and scratches. They're, the, they're, the, the, they're horrible at the time, but the market always recovers. The market yeah. always goes higher than its earlier point. And there's probably some periods there in the 70s where it took a very long time to um, get back to its pre sort of late 60s high. Um, and then similarly, uh, the global financial crisis, um, you can see the, the peak there in 2007, uh, the Australian share market took the best part of 10 years to recover the actual price ratio. Um, but as I often say to clients, forget the price, uh, the dividends is what matter. Um, that's the majority of returns, particularly in Australia with franking credits, um, the, the income is 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 not in this chart. This is just the price chart. Yeah, and I guess that the, the in percentage terms, the biggest impact were the the OPEC crisis in in the seventies, in the mid seventies, which was a fifty nine percent um, drop, a, a fifty percent drop in the eighty seven stock market crash, and then a fifty five percent drop in the global, during the global financial crisis. Uh, at the moment, and we're not necessarily through the COVID. Uh, period yet, but it's it's at the moment showing a thirty percent drop. So, but Mark, um, I'd also point to the period before the eighty seven crash, mm -hmm. and the period before the global financial crisis, and just look at the steepness of the curve in the period yep. before. So, if you actually look at 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 you know six months or twelve months after the crash, you're just returning to the to the shape of the curve. And to be fair, this is a one of those scales that that uh, that I can't remember what the mathematical terminology, but but it is actually an accurate shape of the curve, and the long term return from the share market um, over this hundred years is eleven percent, and that's reflected in the shape of that curve. Yeah, and I guess the 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 significant thing about about the drop in the share market um, this year and sort of that middle week of March. Um, is it happened very, very quickly. Um, and unlike um, other, um, particularly the GFC, where the, the market ran down over probably 18 months or two years, this happened, it felt like it happened within a week. Um, it was probably more likely three or four weeks. Three or four weeks, Mark. It was three or four weeks. I remember it well. And, um, uh, you know, I also remember 2007 very well. And 87, I was working as well in a stockbroking firm. Um, we have these things called dead cat bounces. And, and when I was sitting there in, the, in March and looking at, uh, at this chart, you know, was this a dead cat bounce? You know, could it have, because I remember um, uh, uh, 
I'm going to get the year wrong, but um, in the global financial crisis, it sort of started falling in 2007, but by 2009, March, it went down even further and more, you know, it was really difficult. So the period from March through to sort of now, um, I've been, uh, clients have held a lot of cash um, very deliberately because I've been through this before. Yep. And I guess that ties into, I guess, the, the strategy side of things. And for, for clients out there that are, are seeing their investments fall um, and, you know, what, what do they, what's the strategy around um, managing the volatility and, and not only from an investment point of view, but I guess from a coping point of view as well? Uh, I, I, I've used the same words all my career, but in times of volatility, in times where the business news is terrible, don't open the business pages. Um, uh, read the sports pages. Uh, unfortunately, all the sport got cancelled this time around, so that strategy didn't work. But, you know, bad news gets repeated and retweeted and, and clicked and, and sent all around the world. And my advice on coping is to switch it off. Turn it off. Turn off your notifications um, because it's not your friend. And we know that volatility is normal. We know that fear and greed drives markets in the short term. But in the long run... It's the income, it's the dividends, and it's the expectation of growing dividends that ultimately drives the market. And if you look at this chart, you know, if you measure the share market return over a 20 year basis, or let's call it a retirement, um, the return is actually incredibly predictable and always positive. You know, over, over a long enough period, the share market is always positive. But here's all of those crashes that was in that earlier slide, all those bumps and scratches, they're normal. And the one in 2020 is no more different from several, you know, it's, it was a 37% fall from top to bottom. And it's only my fifth crash in my career, but it's it corrections uh, every other year, as you can see through this chart. Yeah. So I guess the, the other point is if you must look at your, the way that your portfolio is performing, going against your better judgment, um, it's important to, to make sure you're looking at an appropriate time period. Um, because that's going to give you a better reflection of how, of how your, your, your portfolio is performing, I guess. If you look at it every day, five in 10 days will be negative. The fact. Yep. Um, so moving along now to uh, how, I guess, different asset classes have, have performed over um, a similar period. So again, the last sort of 120 years. Yeah, and, and one of the things I get, even though it is one of these sort of funny logarithmic scales, the curve is flattening. Um, cash is not going to deliver 4.7% over the next 10 years as it has over the last 100 years. So the returns from the share market over the next 10 years are unlikely to be 11.5%. But I, I manage expectations in that sort of 8 to 9% return if measured over a long enough period. And that is eight to nine times the current term deposit rate. So oh, even more. Um, but with cash, you get, don't get the volatility. With bonds, you get some volatility. And I remember terrible years like 1994 when the bond market crashed. Uh, we haven't had a proper bond market crash for a while, but one's coming. The reason why bonds crash is when interest rates go up. Um, interest rates aren't going up in the near term, but interest rates will go up and bonds will fall. The price of bonds will fall. Um, so much less volatile holding bonds, but those bumps and scratches, which was in the earlier chart, is the reward for the risk you take. And risk and reward always go hand in hand. Yeah. Um, and although um, property is not on this particular graph, um, it, it would, would it be fair to say it follows a similar trend to the share market yeah, or I, similar I return? Until the cows come home on what the long-term return from property is. And I would say that um, residential property post-war in, in Australian cities has done as well or not, if not better than the share market. Um, and I think there's a, a lot of reasons for that uh, around immigration and, uh, and, and wealth creation and all that sort of stuff. I suspect the long-term property returns on residential from, for the next 30 years uh, will be flatter than they have been in the last 30 years. And my, my thinking around that is, uh, is, is that it's become relatively unaffordable for the younger generation and that, that something has to give there. But leaving that aside, 
shares and property are growth assets, treated as growth assets, because the income, the rents and the dividends grow. So the only reason why the value or the price of a property rises over the very long term is because rents grow. And the only reason why the price of a share grows over time is because the company makes more profits and the dividends grow. The reason why bonds don't provide growth or cash doesn't provide growth is because the interest payments aren't growing. Uh, they can go up and down with interest rates, but ultimately the capital doesn't, doesn't grow. You get the, the interest that you've, you've contracted to get. And I guess um, when we're, you're talking about um, managing the volatility, um, certainly the portfolios that you've constructed, um, certainly for our clients, have a number of shock absorbers in there to, to take some of the, the wild swings away. Yeah, and a really good illustration of that. I mean, at the moment, and there's a slide coming, but you, know, you can put your money in cash and get zero. And, and a lot of our clients do have cash or cash-like and there's a whole lot of reasons for that. But there are other investments that are floating rate um, uh, that will pay the income regardless, um, but the price won't, and they're listed on the stock exchange, mind you, but they, the price won't be as volatile because at the end of the day, they're more like a, a, a loan instrument than a share. They've got some elements of shares, but they've got some elements of loans and they're called hybrids. And our clients have you know, an allocation to these and have done for the last 10 years. And the reason for that is, is the floating rate nature of them and their liquidity. They're available. One of the reasons why the share market is so volatile is because it never closes, except yesterday. <laughs> it closed yesterday. <laughs> um, but, but the theory is that uh, uh, it's always open. And a third of the world's assets are listed on a stock exchange. So the reason why the stock market looks and feels volatile is because it's always open. There's always mm. some mug that will take it off you at a price. Uh, yep. So you can always have your money back uh, within three days. Uh, if you, if the asset that you own is listed on on an on an exchange, yeah. And just um, to cover off on that point, yeah, the reason that the share market was closed yesterday was for due to an IT technical glitch. Nasdaq, um, Nasdaq is the supporting technology, and it failed. Um, so it's good to know everyone else has technology failures from time to time. Um, I guess part of the, the the volatility side is looking at the bounce back um, and. We've got probably here how different sectors have bounced back um, over the last period of time. And I apologise for the um, haziness of it, but over to the left are the financials and the real estate trust, as well as energy stocks. Um, over to the right is the IT stocks, the, the Zooms and the Afterpays and the Amazons. Um, and they all fell. So there's blue lines across the board, um, but certainly in the year 2020, some sectors did poorly um, and some sectors did well. And my, one of my lessons is don't look at last year's best performers when picking stocks for 2021. Um, I would suggest to you that the IT has run very hard um, and is not necessarily the best place to place your money. Um, and in fact, if you look at the analysts uh, in the Australian share market, uh, the consensus is that the banks are cheap. Uh, so banks were last year's worst performers. Uh, I suspect next year um, they could well be, particularly if we don't have a deep recession, they could well be among the better performers. Uh, this next one looks at the uh, bounce back by country. Yeah, so there's Australia. Um, we fell 37%. Uh, most of that's uh, come back. Um, uh, it's uh, strange that the best performing country in the world practically in terms of COVID uh, has had the worst share market performance and the, the, the country with the, uh, with the worst performance on COVID has had the best share market performance, but perhaps that's the flattening curve argument. Yeah. And, and um, a lot of that, as you said, um, could be fed by um, uh, the, the media side of things as opposed to actually what's going on oh, fundamentally. And, and there's no doubt that the US market is, is, has a lot of technology uh, components within that share market. So um, the technology that you saw on the previous chart is a, a large part of the US index. So this is all those bumps and scratches on the earlier charts. The average drawdown in a crash or, or a bear market, we call a bear market a 20% fall, but the average has been 33%. We declined 37% top to bottom in three weeks in February, March. 
uh, and we pretty much got it all back. Um, the actual return, it's, it it's, sounds wrong, but it dropped 33% and it's up 70%. But that's, that's the way the maths works. Um, so we're actually uh, had the best recovery of any of those periods so far. Um, but as I warn there, it's not yet March. Um, we may see some of that come back. Uh, I think the market, in my view, has been uh, more optimistic about 2021 than perhaps it should be. Um, but I could be proven wrong. And at this stage, the market is uh, filled with optimism. And I guess what it's saying, if you look at the averages there, the average uh, it decline of 33%, but then in the, the 12 months afterwards, uh, the gain is only 23%. So it's saying it's it going to take more than a year to recover. We, we have a terminology for that. It's down by the elevator and up by the stairs. That's yep. on the market generally. Yeah. Um, so probably in terms of volatility, uh, there's probably a couple of options um, as in what we can do there. We can, uh, I guess, stay the course or we can try and pick the market. Yep. And if you pick the best days, uh, if, you, if you do a really good job of selling at the top and buying at the bottom, um, uh, this chart is over the last 25 years, uh, you could potentially double your return. Um, unfortunately, uh, my deep experience is that you, you don't get the sell right and the buy right. Um, easy to sell on the way down, but uh, knowing when to buy back is, is the most common mistake. Um, and, and it's actually a very common mistake to sell um, and then to try and buy back. And if you do it and you do it and you miss the worst days, sorry, you miss the best days of the market, uh, you may as well be in cash. You yeah. are just re removing the return from the share market that you could have had. Yeah. So I, my, my advice is, is that 8% as a long-term return from the share market, uh, which is well better than bonds and well better than cash, um, is sufficient reward. And for most people, writing it out. And, and not, none of my clients are 100% invested in the share market, but to the extent they're invested in the share market, um, you know, if I had a client in February 40% in the share market, which was quite typical, uh, and the market fell 37%, then on that day, uh, they were down, whatever it was, 16%. Um, but I can also say that uh, all clients, uh, when they look at the last 12-month return or the last two-year return, uh, you know, are very much returning to positive territory. And, and most importantly, um, whether you buy and sell and try and get this right, um, it's the dividends. It's the dividends that you know, it's my mantra. If you sat down in a client meeting with me, look at the cash book, look at the dividends. Have they changed? Yes, the banks suspended dividends briefly this year, but the, the bank dividends will return next year. Yep. Um, this is another one of your sayings that I've grown accustomed to hearing. <laughs> so Warren Buffett is, is, is he, he talks about Mr. Market. And in the short term, Mr. Market is a voting machine. That's the noise. That's the fear, that's the greed, that's the tweets, that's all of that. Um, but in the long term, the share market will value the future dividends. That's how we in the investment game ultimately decide whether or not Telstra or Westpac is a good buy. What do we think the dividends going to be like in five years' time? It's a weighing machine. And that, that goes to the heart of a lot of these slides, that if you ignore the noise, ignore the voting machine, ignore the tweets... Uh, and just focus on the dividends and whether or not we believe they're going to grow, then the market will look after itself. It's the same in the property market. And, you know, this slide I said earlier, if you looked at it every day, and there are people on this call that look at it every day, I have no doubt. But five days out of 10 will be a bad day. And five days out of 10 will be a good day. If you look at your super fund balance once a year, as I recommend you do, eight days or eight years out of 10 years will be positive. And your 2020 statement that's probably finally arrived in your account now will be one of those negative years. But don't look at it. Don't worry about it because this is 30 year, 40 year, 50 year money. And the truth about the Australian share market is that if you hold it for a retirement, if you hold it for more than a decade, 10 decades out of 10 will be positive. Yeah, so I think the message is pretty clear there, and and I, I myself 
um, having hearing it nearly every time that I speak to you, um, do find it difficult not to look at the balances of, of portfolios and superannuation balances every day. Um, but yeah, understanding that, that that measure is at a particular point in time. Um, and the, the more accurate representation is that the longer the point in time, the longer the period of time that you're measuring, the more accurate representation you'll get. Yeah. Um, so we might move along now. Um, we're in this strange world where interest rates are, are virtually zero. The cash rate is virtually zero. Um, and you know what impact does that have on certainly clients? And, you know, if we cast our mind back um, probably five or six years ago, um, a number of clients would be living off their term deposit interest, um, and that has is not not possible anymore. Um, you know, how has the drop in interest rates influenced um, markets? Uh, certainly, cutting interest rates through twenty twenty has encouraged the share market along. Um, no question about that. Um, because it's pretty simple to sort of look at your term deposit rate and go, and when it comes up to roll and it's got a zero in front of it, um, rather than a one or a two or a three in front of it, it's pretty easy to go and look at the share market for a better return. Um, and and this, this, is, this was published by NAB with, with their interim results um, just last week. And you know, most of the deposits are already at zero. And Matt Coleman, who's the CEO of CBA also said during the week that if, if we were pricing deposits properly, they'd be negative. So our normal margin that we'd earn on a deposit, but we can't offer a, a negative interest rate product in Australia. We, we, we can't do it. But so the reality is we're dealing with, um, uh, you know, there's 9 million customers of, of National Australia Bank. A lot of them are depositors and they're not actually being paid any interest. Um, I'd like to be in one of the $42.5 billion uh, worth of customers that are on more than 1%. I'm not sure, <laughs> I'm not sure whether they've got a, a, a call to the, to the CEO, but um, we are dealing with zero interest rates. And if you can go to the next slide, Mark, um, to try and put that in context, um, if you have an app call internet-based account at NAB, UBank it's called, um, you're probably going to get uh, 0.15. And if you, I put up there $1.6 million. That's what the Liberal Party and the Labor Party kind of landed on about two elections ago that was kind of the maximum comfortable retirement that Australians would be prepared to wear. So if you've got $1.6 million in a super fund and you're in pension mode, that's a comfortable retirement or where it was. Because today, even if you put it on 12 month deposit, that's and if you could actually receive the interest weekly, that's $184 a week. That's not comfortable. So people are being forced up the risk curve. And I said earlier, reward and risk go hand in hand. And there's a couple of um, securities there, Australian Stock Exchange Securities, which are hybrids. National Australia Bank is, is a very secure security relative to the one, the NABHA is much more secure than the NABPG. Um, and the NAB term deposit is much more secure than NABHA. Uh, in, a, in a crisis, the government will step in and guarantee the deposits of National Australia Bank up to $250,000, whereas NAB is not going to guarantee these payments. But the holder of NABHA will be paid before the holder of NABPG, which is a hybrid listed on the stock exchange issued by National Australia Bank at this week. It's being issued this week at 3.4% above the bank bill rate. Now, 3.4% above the bank bill rate, unfortunately, is 3.4%. So whereas only a couple of years ago, that would look more like a five in front of it um, for a hybrid and be paying $1,500, $1,600 a week, it's now $1,000 a week. Um, National Australia Bank's yield uh, is lower because all the banks have dropped their yields, but the gross yield is roughly 4%, $1,230. Um, you've probably seen the television ads on for a, for a mortgage fund. I won't name it at four and a half percent. And the only thing I caution you about all of that, well, two things. One is if it's advertising, it's usually not receiving money from proper research or from uh, licensed financial planners. It's doing it by way of advertising, which is always for me an alarm bell. Um, but secondly, uh, if they're paying 4.5% out from their borrowers, who are they lending to? If the National Australia Bank is lending to customers in your street, 
and they're paying 2% on their loan um, fixed for three years, which you can now get. Um, they're able to pay you a deposit rate on a 12 month term deposit of 0.6. If someone can give you a term account and it is not a term deposit, uh, ASIC is all over this, it is a term account. But if a television advertiser can pay you 4.5%, you have to consider who is paying that interest. Who is the borrower? And that borrower cannot be um, the, the, the same borrower as, as at NAB, um, if you like. Yep. Um, last year, a, a client of ours, mutual client of ours, Mark, um, uh, saw an advertisement and, a, and an email offering a, a 6% rate um, on, on, on what was looked and felt like a term account. Um, that that uh, institution, IPO Wealth, uh, Mayfair Platinum is no longer advertising. Um, and had that customer put that money in, they wouldn't have got their 6% and they're most likely not going to get their capital back either. So uh, oh, fair warning, um, if we're going up the interest rate curve, we're going up the risk curve. Um, I've put one investment down there, which most of our mutual clients would own. I don't really want to name it, but it's a property trust. Um, this is general advice only, but it is a property trust that collects rent from the government and is paying monthly rent of 7%. Um, you can get 5 or 6% from lots of blue chip shares. Uh, you can get 5 or 6% from good property opportunities um, uh, where you own the asset. Um, and I would rather that than go up the interest rate risk curve. Yep. Just uh, I've been attending... Um... Uh, annual self-managed super fund conference this week and one of the stats that that um, was shared among that was that uh, across self-managed super funds um, the average self-managed super fund or sorry the yeah, the average self-managed super fund has 26 percent of its assets in cash and i would say and mark you would know this that the tony bates client base uh in november 2020 wouldn't be wildly far from that or cash yeah. Yeah. Um, somewhere in the order of 15 to 20% across my book. Yeah. And then it's interesting, those for those funds that have less than $200,000 in them, this is self-managed super funds only, that increased to 46%. Um, so obviously for those investors with such low balances, um, probably need to have a look at things because... Well, they, no they're not looking at their super funds. Because generate they're getting return. a zero return. Yeah. Yeah. And, and cash... Um, uh, well, I, well I'll, there's a slide coming, but I'll talk to cash. But um, this is, this. you know, what should you do in the next 10 years? You should do what you, uh, the advice has been for the last 10 years and the previous 10 years. And that is to invest in a balanced portfolio of shares and property and bonds and cash. And this is literally Mercer Investment Consulting balanced super funds returns over the last, uh, well, what's that? nearly 40 years um, and you can see again that volatility there's some bad years and some good years but the 10-year return has been coming down from the 90s why because inflation is down but the real return is still six percent thereabouts um, uh, on an ongoing on a 10-year rolling basis um, so you know people ask me what's the, what should i expect from a balanced portfolio and i say you know, the inflation rate plus, or I say six to seven percent. And if you look at Vanguard's 20 year return as a balanced fund and their 10 year return, it's going to be something like six to seven percent. Um, and I'm picking Vanguard because they're a passive manager. So, you know, this is the change in the last, well, since the global financial crisis. We saw interest rates cut uh, from seven and a half percent to three and a half percent. In, in a matter of months um, and then rebound. But the real drama of the last 10 years is interest rates going down below five, down below four, down below three, down below two, to zero, to zero. Um, and therefore you need to invest in things that will pay you a return because you've got to eat. If you only invested your super fund in cash, um, as we saw on the earlier slide, $100 a week is not going to cut it. You know, that's, that's, that's dinner out. Um, so you need to take on risk. And the way to take on risk is to include shares and property as long, uh, along with bonds and hybrids and cash. And you can see there now 
the yield on the share market and the yield on property, commercial property, is, well, if the term deposit rate's 0.4, it's 10 times the term deposit rate or more. And it's never been like that in my career. So uh, you need to take on those risk assets, those growth assets, um, and then not look at them. Not look, just ignore the volatility because at the end of the day, $1.6 million earning 1% is 16 grand a year and no one can eat with that. You mentioned, Tony, um, in, in a couple of slides back with this uh, particular investment in relation to the TV advertising and, and taking on risk and, and investors not getting their money back. Um, what are some of the things that, that people can look for in, in order to, you know, pre- I guess, protect their capital in, in yeah. the recession? For me, there's a few things. Um, one is gearing. Uh, this is not the time to be borrowing. Um, the risk is that the banks will force your hand. Um, banks in Australia tend not to force mortgage sales too quickly. Uh, and so I often say that the Sydney resident or the, the, the residential markets of Australia are underwritten by the banks because they'll give you a couple of years often. So we haven't seen mortgagee sales at this stage. We've seen banks writing off um, some of their loans, but they're not actually calling them in at this early stage, but they may. Um, so don't be in a situation where the bank decides whether or not to own that asset. And that was very much a lesson um, from the 1991 period um, and also from the global financial crisis. Uh, um, avoid advertised products. Um, if you don't understand them, don't invest in them. Um, uh, if you don't understand why someone can pay 4.5% and now paying 0.45%, you know, don't invest in it. Um, but diversify. Um, if you want to put money in a higher rate security, um, don't put all your eggs in one basket. I remember very well, uh, 1990, talking to an estate mortgage unit holder. Some of you might be old enough to remember estate mortgage in 1990. And, you know, I was a kid at that stage, but I said, you know, hadn't you heard of diversification? And the lady on the phone said, I was diversified. I had pyramid building society. I had estate mortgage. There were like three or four major collapses and she had all of them. So just, just be mindful um, that last year's best performer or the one that advertises the most, uh, don't take money out of other investments and put them into that one and build up and have too much exposure to any one investment is, is certainly a very good uh, yeah. tip. And I guess um, I, I remember a client telling me this a couple of years ago now, we were talking about diversification um, and he was saying uh, not only to, that he doesn't have all these eggs in the one basket um, and he's talking about at shares at the time, but then he said, but I also don't have all my baskets in the one truck, um, which is probably the next level of diversification. It's, it's, it's well and good to diversify within an asset class, but then it's also important to have a number of different asset classes um, and I would in add, your portfolio. Add, and entities potentially. So asset lo- allocation, but also asset location. So you can have your yep. growth assets in your super fund, but if you need money next month, it should be in cash and it should be in your own name. Yep. Yep. Uh, speaking of cash, that's um, a lesson to be learned there. Yeah. Having cash, I, I've got clients and they say, but, you know, why is it in the Panorama cash account earning zero? And I go, well, because if you put it into a cash fund, it would earn zero. And if you put in a term deposit, it get zero. I mean, two years ago, we, we could diversify away from cash and get a better return. But at the moment, um, the cost of cash is zero return. Um, the benefit of cash is protecting your capital. And I would never advocate going 100% to cash ever, but having 20% in cash when the share market's a little bit optimistic, which I believe it is, uh, is not a bad idea. Yep. Um, And this is probably a lesson learnt from the the GFC in relation to the unlisted funds and the hedge funds. Yeah, and, and, and earlier periods. I mean, I went through the property trusts and the mortgage trusts all closing in 1989, 1990, um, And I thought I learned all the lessons, um, but, but the ability of a fund to say, no, you can't have your money back um, uh, is, is, you know, a lesson learned twice in my career. Um, so minimize, you know, that CHDPF fund that was paying 7%, it's an unlisted fund. You can't get your money out on a three-day basis. I'm, I don't let clients have 20% of their, wealth in something like that is more like 5% or 10%. 
Uh, so, uh, you know, you may need to use some funds, but understand what's the, what, whether or not you'll be able to get the money out. And the hedge funds in particular, in, in, in that period uh, uh, of the global financial crisis, the markets, they were supposed to protect if markets fall, but the markets didn't just fall, as one hedge fund manager said, they failed. And so the hedge funds actually blew up uh, terribly. So I've tended to avoid hedge funds uh, for the last 10 years. Yep. And then the final one is the liquidity side of things. The Australian Stock Exchange, the New York Stock Exchange and the London Stock Exchange is open every business day for a period of time, except yesterday. <laughs> That's where you can get your money. So I like to have the majority of my clients' capital where I know I can have the money back in three days. Um, yep. So liquidity, uh, it, it, it doesn't matter that the underlying asset of, of the stock exchange listed security is a bridge or a port or a factory or a building. It matters that I can take my money out. So that's why uh, a lot of my clients have a lot of their money in listed investments. And that goes to that liquidity. So if we're going to um, cast our mind forward and have a look at 2021 and beyond, um, you've it's the roaring 20s um, version two. Um, in terms of asset allocation, are there certain things that you've got your eye on or certain sectors that, that may perform better than others? Yeah. Um, the, one, the one that I've got the single biggest question mark over uh, as, we, as we go into Christmas 2020 is office buildings. What does that look like in 2022? You know, I, I just talked earlier about the government paying rent on, on office buildings in a, in a fund that I've got clients in, and they are paying the rent. And the 7% is arriving religiously and the properties are being revalued. But what if the government decides more of their people will work at home in 2022? Um, so that's, that's the asset class that I'm most concerned about is the office space market. There are, it, it, there are other sectors of property like distribution and um, the, that, that whole sort of people ordering online and, and all of that warehousing and distribution that I think uh, are better than office buildings. Um, I, I, I believe uh, that in 30 years, the banks won't be dominant in Australia. So across my client base, we're underweight banks. Um, but I do think 2021 will be a good year for the banks. So uh, we're certainly increasing allocations. But at the heart of it, Mark, is this. If the money's in, needed in 20 years and 30 years and 40 years time, i.e. super, I tend to dial up the, the shares and property, what we call the growth assets. And if the money's needed in the next six months, two years, then the asset allocation is dialed appropriately down so that you don't take on that market volatility. But the, the underlying truth is the same, that if you have a risk profile and a time horizon that, rec, that suggests, that, that is typical, let me use that word, that is typical, so you're, a, you're accumulating super uh, over the next 40 years, you should be investing in a balanced portfolio, possibly a balanced a growth portfolio. Um, and, and my recommendation is if you go for the growth uh, in your super fund, um, don't look at it or look at it once a year. Yeah, and you, I guess you mentioned earlier on that um, you know not looking at sectors that perform or understanding that sectors that performed well uh, during 2020 aren't necessarily going to be the the star performers of of 2021, and probably some of the the specifics around that which you mentioned IT, but particularly Afterpay is probably the one that everyone's talking about. Yep. Um, I, I can't buy it at today's prices. Um, even if it dropped twenty percent, I'd, I'd, I'd struggle to buy it um, for clients. I and Mark, you know this. I love dividends. One of the things yes. I love about dividends is the franking credits that you get with the dividends because that company has paid tax in Australia. Um, that is that is the at least half of the return of the share market, and it's the reliable part. It's the part that arrives regularly. And the wonderful thing about the Australian banks actually is that they pay in a different period to the rest of it. So you actually get a, an income during the year and the hybrids as well. So I'm, I'm very focused on the, the, the income, rent, interest and dividends landing in bank accounts. And yep. I think you should have all three. That's why I think you should be asset allocated. If you prefer property over shares, fine, but have some shares. If you prefer shares over property, that's fine, but have, have some exposure to property. Yep. Uh, and just quickly, do you have a view on the residential property market going forward? Yeah, I, and it's changed. Um, 
Bill Evans is the economist for um, uh, uh, Westpac, and he came out with this view a couple of weeks ago, or maybe three or four weeks ago, and it, it, I, I sat and thought about it quite hard. So I think I'm pretty bullish about the residential market in the next couple of years. Um, the reasons are, are, are threefold. Um, one is that um, interest rates are lower for longer. The Reserve Bank has said so. So we're basically saying zero interest rates. The second reason is the government has basically told the banks to throw out the rule book, go and lend. Um, all of that responsible lending, throw it out. Um, and the third is that I think we are, the economy is not going to be as bad as we perhaps feared in July. Um, that we, there is a, there is a, there is a, um, a vaccine, a cure. As, as, I don't know about a cure, but there's, there, we, we are managing these outbreaks, um, even in Adelaide. You know, we're shutting down Adelaide for the right reasons. So I think people are feeling more confident about going about their daily lives. So the banks won't be calling in um, on problem loans that everyone thought they might be back in July. So I'm optimistic about the uh, normal cycle uh, that, that, it, that happens after a, a dip in, the, in, in any market. Very good. Well, thanks, Tony, for that very comprehensive update. Um, again, it's probably one that I'll need to go back and have a look at this presentation again. We got through so much content today. So re again, really appreciate um, sharing your time with us this morning. And I'm sure that everyone will have um, something to take away and, and importantly, um, to start planning for what might happen um, next next financial or, or next calendar year, sorry. And I think that the key part is, is to have a plan. It's really important that just have a plan and, and stick to it. Um, that's probably the, the, the first step. So thanks again, Tony. Um, really appreciate um, your time this morning. Um, also like to thank Jess for helping us out with the slides um, this week. So thanks, Jess. I think you're and on the, on if the I webinar. Can say it's, it's nearly December. Uh, we had a crap Christmas last year. It was awful with the bushfires. I think we should all just have a really good Christmas. <laughs> wish for all, everyone. Yep. Uh, and if you've got any further questions, um, please feel free to reach out um, to myself or, or even Tony and we can get you in, in contact with Tony. So um, thanks again. Next week's webinar, uh, we're going to have a look at um, where to find funding and capital so that businesses can grow and expand in 2021. So um, Tim Eisenhower from On Market will be um, joined by Gary Pinch next week um, to, to run through um, sourcing capital um, and allowing businesses to, to use that capital to grow and expand. So we look forward to that uh, webinar next week. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us today and uh, have a good day. Thank you.